Thank you for joining us. I, I appreciate there's a lot of choice, so we're, we're honoured to have you here. Um, my name is, is Andrew French and I'm with, with Smartly. And I've had a quick testimony and a quick plug there, but we are uh, a technology company that enables people to run advertising campaigns on top of Facebook and, and Instagram. And our goal really is to drive automation for marketers to make that more efficient and to use automation to get better results from their paid investments. So um, the topic today is how Facebook is shaping social shopping. And we've got a quick Mary Mika. There's actually quite a lot of feedback, guys. I don't know if that's just me, but there is a Mary Mika slide just to set the scene that talks about ads becoming a targeted storefront. The concept is you walk down the high street, you see products that you would like to purchase, you walk in and then you make those purchases. When you look at the, the news feed or the content feeds of Facebook and other social platforms, they're in essence recreating that same scenario where you have the ability to see multiple products and choose the products that you would like to purchase. So um, today we're very fortunate to have a great panel um, that are using um, Facebook and other media channels to promote various different products. So I'll let these guys introduce themselves, starting with, with Luke. Hi guys, uh, I'm Luke Costley White. Uh, I'm a growth marketer at Cornerstone, so I'm in charge of uh, paid social and uh, paid search. We're a uh, men's grooming subscription service. Uh, we use Facebook as our major like acquisition channel. Hi, I'm Kate Haynes. I work at Wonderbly. We were formerly known as Lost My Name. Uh, we make personalized children's books and uh, I work in the performance team as a paid social manager. My name's Chris Simpson. I'm the Director of Digital Performance at More2. Uh, we're an independent agency focused on helping mainly retailers and e-commerce businesses grow. Uh, and I run the digital performance side, so um, search and paid social. Cool, so we're, we're hoping today to give a few tips and some, some real world insights into how to, to run digital acquisition. So to start off with guys, um, the question was, what has the evolution of Facebook feed becoming a shoppable storefront look like for you? And then what was the, what was the inflection point? So let's just start from, from Luke. Yeah, I think for me, um, it kind of started from as soon as I started doing Facebook marketing and paid social in general, just the ability of Facebook especially to be able to uh, you know, target anyone you want, uh, to be very specific in kind of the groups that you were, you were looking for. Uh, and then from that, they kind of built on that with all of these amazing ad formats. Like initially, everyone was just using images or video, which was basically just like a, almost like a print ad of like, this is what our product is, please come and buy it. But now it's kind of moving towards a more sort of interactive, immersive experience where you're kind of like going into the feed and the idea is that you can tell the story of your product. Uh, and yeah, it's just moving forwards all the time. Uh, and I think we're going to get more and more different formats uh, to try and, you know, convince people that it's still a great way to buy our products. Yeah, um, I think I would agree. Um, we've certainly seen, I think, since the uh, implementation of the of the conversion pixel where I felt like you have shifted from as you say just sort of showing uh, a targeted group of people an ad and then just sort of waiting to see what comes in to being able to track all of that purchase behavior and, and actions on the site and then use that data to either retarget those people or to build audiences from them and become even more kind of hyper targeted um, so that I think is, is kind of where I feel like the, the inflection point was, but thereafter, and certainly in the last 12 to 18 months, it feels as though uh, they've really been accelerating in terms of the number of formats that are available, and also in terms of the number of placements. Um, so obviously they bought in Instagram a few years ago, now we're looking at um, ads in Messenger, also in their marketplace. Um, so there's lots of, yeah, still lots of opportunity, I think. Yeah, I think for me, the inflection was um, with the advent of Carousel, which is a truly shoppable it was like a shop window. Um, and I think, to your point about the data, uh, it's the combination of audience data, which you can upload your customers, um, prospects, and the rich product data, exactly what people are shopping for, that gives you that flexibility to serve personal ads. Um, and it, it feels to me like Facebook are heading further and further along the purchase path towards, um, uh, you know, right up to the point where you actually buy something. So you almost don't need to go to the website until you're ready to buy because your shopping list is kind of there with you. And so, so as a marketer, you have a product obviously that you want to sell to people. Where do you, where do you start? Because you've all talked about already formats and data and lots of different kind of opportunities, but where do you start like the planning process or where do you start thinking about the customer? 
and how to get the product out to market. I think I'm starting with kind of the data that you already know about uh, who that customer is and what they look like. Um, and then kind of deciding which is the right platform in order to reach them. And thereafter, kind of the best audiences um, that are, are going to enable you to kind of be hyper relevant um, and, and really targeted to, to the right kind of person. Um, and I think that's where Facebook has really excelled. The targeting, I think, is kind of second to none. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where you would, you would want to start. It's just kind of looking to match uh, those people and find them on Facebook. And thereafter, it's kind of just tailoring your creative to speak to them as best you can. Okay. Um, I think uh, for a lot of the, the retailers we work with, they've got, they're launching you know, hundreds of new products at a time or they've got big product catalogs. So a lot of that question is answered through uh, dynamic ad format. So you're able to um, sort of plug in, let Facebook worry about the creative to a great extent. And then it comes down to nailing down your audiences and saying, okay, how do I, I've got a group I can remarket to. That's the kind of the easy bit. But how can I how can I use my dynamic feeds to acquire new customers? Uh, and Facebook's product uh, broad audience is is really powerful for that. So actually targeting people who are in market for your product on other people's website. Um, so uh, we found that works really well, and it, and it kind of so the planning process actually becomes it, it's sort of driven by the Facebook stack in a way rather than having to do a lot of manual thinking. I think for us, uh, you know, we're, we're very specific about what the group we're looking for is. Um, obviously, as a men's grooming company, it's, it's pretty specific. Um, and so it's more about kind of finding the best place for that group, whether that's, you know, an interest that they might, uh, that might relate to them that you find through Audience Insights, or whether that's, you know, looking at a different uh, seed audience that you can build a lookalike out of. And then it's just about finding the right sort of message that's going to kind of click with that group uh, in the best way. I think you you just go through kind of like if you could break down my business into like what's what's the most valuable bit and what's what's the part if you could explain it to a friend in like five minutes, what you would say about the product and then how you can show that to the people in the best place. And then so so you so with regards to the sort of the product feed, how do you decide which products to show to which audiences? How do you build those? those ads and how do you bring those catalogs into the creative environment? I can take that. Um, sure. So uh, we actually, uh, we only have eight titles in our, in our product range. Um, so we don't have a, a really huge catalog of products to, uh, from which to choose. Um, but what we have found from looking at our direct and organic traffic is we know that our, our best selling and flagship uh, first title, Lost My Name, um, most people who come who, who um, haven't seen an ad will choose that as their first title and okay. there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, probably uh, because it's been around the longest, um, we've got quite a lot of PR around it, um, but also um, the, the mechanics of creating the book are quite easy. You just need a child's name, you put that in and, and you, you have a book. So it's, it's very kind of friction free in terms of making the book. So we know that that works really well as a conversion and acquisition product. So we use that um, and, and take that data and then use that as the uh, sort of leading product in all of our, or most of our advertising. Um, what we then do, once people have received the book and they understand the quality and they, and they really bought into the brand, then we use our retention campaigns and showcase the rest of the range. And then uh, that's how we can kind of then um, build out and, and get sort of more lifetime value out of those customers. Um, what we've also been doing more recently is actually a similar approach uh, to yourself is, is having a, a much broader kind of setup where we have a range of different um, ad units and products and we put them all into a broad targeting feed um, and we just kind of let Facebook and the algorithm do its work and it then kind of finds the best ad for and the best product for, for whoever it's it's um, showing to, and that seems to be working really well. So, um, yeah, so we have we've kind of uh, come at it from two different angles. Sure. Same with you, Chris. Any differences or? Um, yeah, I think uh, well, <coughs> some of our clients have like hundreds of thousands of products. So in that case, you're using flags in the feed to refine the best sellers, most profitable products, that sort of thing. Um, but we also, for most of our clients, we run their database, so we can analyze which categories acquire the best long-term customers, which drive the best lifetime value, um, and focus on those categories for acquisition campaigns. But I think essentially the, the big thing, the big theme here is actually you need to serve the right product to the right person to acquire them. And, and driving lifetime value down the road is 
you know, is again about that individual. It's not, it's less about kind of predefining what someone should want on their first order. Um, it's about relevance. And so, so would, you, would you argue that the, the audience is more important than the creative? Um, like how, would you, how would you sort of put those two together? Um, I, think, I think that's probably right. And the key point about audiences is, is knowing what they're worth so that you can bid appropriately in the auction. So if you know someone is, has visited the site in the last seven days, you should be able to outbid anyone for that audience, let's say, as opposed to someone who's visited, you know, three, six months ago. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's, it's setting your bid strategy appropriately to just make sure you get in front of the people you need to. And actually, the creative bit in some ways is, um, is easier. I, I say that from a sort of retailer point of view. I think if you've got one product, there's a ton of work around refining that and testing and learning for different audiences. Yeah. With, with you guys, um, uh, Luke, so obviously you have a smaller catalog, I guess, as well. Yeah. How, do you, how do you blend that creativity versus audience? And how do you go about you know, differential bidding and getting the right price for the right audience? Yeah, I think it, it becomes, uh, you know, we, we do the same kind of concept as kind of wonderfully have spoken about where we're in this disruptor single product moving to a multi-product kind of thing. And it, it becomes about like you, you try and get people in uh, on, your, on your main uh, flagship product at the lowest price possible. Um, and then you're trying to like make back that profitability through kind of upsells or cross-sells along the way. So obviously we have a subscription business. Uh, so we'll try and get people through perhaps a cheaper, less efficient uh, audience in terms of um, average order value, and then we can upsell them afterwards. So you can get someone in on purely getting our, our razor product and then adding skincare products or, or whatever it is after the fact. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are starting to do. But as we're adding more sort of product families to our line, the idea is that we'll then similar to what uh, Chris has said, you, you then uh, will base your feed around which, which thing is more effective for which group. So you can then segment the groups that have bought the products and find, okay, say our new dental range or whatever it might be is working really well with this segment. So we would want to show those ads to those people uh, and vice versa for the other products. And then how does, how does that work then with like other channels as well? So how would you run sort of that, that strategy across multiple channels? Yeah, so um, we, we do some sort of preferential bidding um, for search and things like that. So if you've come to our site uh, and you've looked at our products, then, then we'll bid up on that group uh, more aggressively. And then we'll also share those audiences across onto Twitter um, so that, you know, we're, we're always trying to find that group of people wherever it's going to be most efficient. It doesn't really matter to us whether that's on Facebook or Twitter or search. Um, and then we'll attribute it back. Okay. What about yourselves? How do you how do you take that kind of the storefront of Facebook? I guess you, you message some some audiences, you get some interest. How do you then marry that with other channels to make sure the overall sort of marketing approach is effective? Uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of taking the same approach across all of the channels. So, um, for example, for Pinterest, we'll be using the same kind of seed audiences to be able to build lookalikes, same retargeting pools, uh, the same kind of retention lists. Um, and similarly, um, we'll take some of the insights that we've gathered from our search activity and we'll use those to build the keyword lists in Pinterest so that yeah. we sort of, there's a, there's, we take the learnings that we've made uh, from one channel and we can apply them um, on another without having to sort of start from scratch. So there's a lot of shared learnings that I think you can apply um, across channels that, um, that can uh, save you a lot of time and, and, uh, and work. Yeah, Chris? Yeah, I think it feels like um, for, for the most mature platforms, uh, certainly Facebook, Google, Pinterest increasingly, um, uh, the, there are two data sources. There's what you know about your customers and there's what you know about your products. And I think those two can drive an enormous amount of um, kind of uh, relevance. They can drive your targeting strategy. Um, and you, if you're using the same foundation across you know, whatever the platform is, uh, I think you can get a very consistent user experience um, and you can also acquire the right type of people whichever um, channel they favour. Um, so. And then do you have specific approaches to attribution then on the, on the back of that or do you, how do you model your attribution? Um, we, we're, we're able to be pretty, um, uh, we were able to do a matchback analysis on, on existing customers. So 
let's say you've got half a million customers, you, um, you're targeting them across whatever channel, Facebook or Google or whatever, we hold back control groups and look at the uplift on adding them to the campaign versus the group who've not been added, a bit like a manual lift test. Um, okay. So we do that on active customers or known customers. On acquisition, you're reliant on the platform. So it could be Facebook's attribution, it could be GA. I mean, we all know that GA is not going to do justice to Facebook's kind of results. So Why would you say that? Uh, <laughs> something about analytics being free. I don't, there must be a reason. Um, but uh, so, yeah, we actually try and reconcile those things and then we, we reference what we're seeing on the matchback for existing customers and say, like, the truth is there somewhere and it's, it's trying to find a proxy for what that is. Um, and usually, you ha because you're optimizing to the, the channel reporting, Facebook it might be, you have to find a proxy within it, which might be seven days post-click and one day post-view or something like that. Um, so I think, and, and that's actually where we end up for a lot of our retailers. Yeah, and then with you guys, Luke, at, at Cornerstone, you obviously use traditional media as well. So I know I see quite a lot of press ads and, and, and tube ads. How do you model that into the mix when it comes to, to recognizing the value of those channels? Yeah, so we, we try and use kind of a three-step three, three step method across, across all of our channels. So uh, obviously for all of the digital channels, you have all of the attribution within their own system. So you have that number and you plug that into a spreadsheet. Then you take, uh, we have like coupon or promo redemptions for each channel. So you have a different code for each channel that you're running. Um, and so then you can look at the numbers for that. And then finally, at the end of the purchase journey, you have a attribution survey, which says, you know, where did you hear about us? And then you can weight each of those. Uh, and then you can look at kind of like how those numbers correspond. Um, and that allows you to see kind of the, the, the halo effect of things like TV and stuff like that. You can very easily see TV's effect on branded search. If you do a, uh, if you take a flat line of your performance for the last couple months, you can then look at the effect, the lift effect essentially. Uh, that that has on your branded search, but you can also see that effect into other channels like Facebook and stuff like that, where you see someone who's who's bought uh, via Facebook has a coupon from Facebook, but then actually says, you know, I heard about you through TV. So you know, using using that combined with some of the tools that are out there like TV Squared and things like that, that allows you to get kind of a more digital esque picture of your attribution for those channels, even ones where you wouldn't imagine there to be kind of analytics available. Okay, I mean, we've dug a little bit into the sort of the bottom of the funnel and the conversion event, but with, with Wonderbly, how many people have heard of Wonderbly, by the way? How many people know the product? Okay, a few, a handful. Um, work to be done. Work to be done, <laughs> but, um, but now's the chance. So, um, but in terms of your product, obviously there's some awareness to be done, right? mm -hmm. there's some, some branding to be done. How do, you, how do you go about creating that awareness? Or how do you go about starting to show the customer they need the product? Well, so, uh, I mean, all of the activity that we run um, has a, a conversion focus. So uh, we do very little awareness marketing uh, per se. Um, so everything sort of bottom line needs to be kind of um, ROI positive and um, needs to come in under a sort of a CPA target. Having said that, we um, in our attribution model, we have a multi-touch attribution model which uh, into which we pull uh, Facebook impression data from their order ID data. Um, and because we have that, we can see every touch point that we've had um, for each customer and the chain uh, and where each of those touch points has occurred. Um, and from that, we can see kind of the uh, effect that those impressions, although they were for a sort of conversion objective, we can see where people have uh, been delivered an impression on Facebook, but actually later come in and, and uh, converted um, either from a direct or, or via search. So we have a better picture of, of how, um, even though our, our ads are conversion focused, that they are sort of serving an awareness um, purpose alongside that. Okay, and then we, we've spoken a lot about data, and obviously Facebook's been in the news recently with regards to data. I think it'd be remiss of us to do a panel on Facebook without having some reference to that. So you guys are obviously pretty advanced marketers um, within Facebook. So where, where do you see the kind of the line or the boundary between like personalization um, and maybe slightly over the line of, of, of too, too close? So uh, Chris, we'll go to you, go to you first. Um, we've done a lot of work on this with GDPR just around the corner. Um, 
uh, you know, every business we talk to is, is worried about how they're using personal information, how they're keeping it, is it secure? Um, and the, uh, it really varies per brand, actually. It's what's suitable for the brand, and ultimately, they have to make the decision. So we're not, we can sort of advise from the sidelines. But um, I think, for the most part, people are, um, people are, uh, most of the companies we talk to are pretty responsible. They're, they're actually erring on the side of caution. So if, if people are um, opting out of email, for example, or if they've, if they've not been in touch with the band for um, three, four years or something like that, they're just saying, look, blanket, we're not going to communicate with um, people on Facebook. We're not going to include them in the targeting audiences. Um, and, and I think when it comes to how personalized the ads are, I think people expect relevance. They expect, um, uh, they don't expect it to be thrown in their face that they've recently, you know, we're watching them and we know everything about them. Yep. Um, but uh, uh, for the most part, it feels like the, um, the power is within the brand's control and, and it's really up to them how, how they use it, actually. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's, uh, there's a kind of a balance there between personalising and making things relevant and then tipping over that balance into things just being really creepy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously we get um, data on, on children's names as part of the process of creating a book um, and we can match that to um, the pixel so that we know that that specific person uh, or Facebook user created a book for X name. Um, and uh, what would be really cool is if we use that name in further advertising to say, OK, you bought this book, but do you want to have a book for um, Freddie? And we'll show them all of the new, new range um, with that name in. But I think that sort of tips the balance into just being really uncomfortable um, and reminding people, I think, that that data exists and yeah. I think as a brand you want to be cautious of you know um, going too far in terms of your personalization um, so I think there's yeah there's definitely a balance to be struck between relevance and and creepiness sure yeah I think I think it's about uh, you know putting it in perspective really like I think a lot of people uh, you know talk about how like the, the data usage by social media can be really creepy and you know it can have a really negative effect but if you put that into an offline setting where, you know, you go into a shop, you look at a product and you go, oh, I like this, but, you know, do you have it in another color? color? And then they bring it to you. That's, that's you know, personalizing your shopping experience uh, in order to make it, you know, a more effective um, interaction. And I think, you know, when, when you're using it in that sort of a way where you're just, you know, if, if you went on ASOS and you looked at a shirt, you would expect it to be okay if they then showed you that product again and be like, oh, did you like this or something like that. If you go on Amazon, they do exactly the same thing. You know, with uh, whenever you go on Next, they're like, we saw that you looked at this product, maybe you'd like these things. And when they're relevant, it's not a problem because you're like, oh yeah, I actually do really like that product. That was really useful. You know, when they recommend a new film to you on Netflix, you don't think, oh shit, I wish they weren't gathering my data. You just think, oh, that's a great film. I like it. Um, so I think as long as you're using it for that and you're not using it in a, a detrimental way that's really in your face or really offensive, uh, then I think, I think it's great. And I think that that's you know, the power that digital uh, marketing has over any other channel. Like if you had the ability to walk a shop front, like you see in some sci-fi films where you walk past and it, each, each mannequin changes to the stuff that you would like, that would be an amazing shopping experience. And that's what I think brands would like to be able to provide. Cool, so I think there's a hint there. We should move on to Slido. There's no timer here, guys, by the way, so perhaps give me a nod when we're, when we're up. But um, the first question, actually, I'd like to ask is the middle one. So um, what percentage of your sales are coming directly from Facebook activity? Chris, probably a little bit harder for you, but maybe we could start, um, we could start with you. Uh, I mean, it's, it's Facebook represents the majority of our paid marketing spend, so it's a, it's a fair proportion of, um, of, of where we're spending our money and we invest quite heavily um, in Facebook. That balance shifts slightly in Q4, which is a really big seasonal um, period for us as the books are quite often bought for Christmas presents. Um, and then we have like uh, much more spend in, in TV 
and out of home um, than we do in the rest of the year. So that balance does, does shift slightly. Um, what I would say is that we're quite opportunistic with Facebook. So um, when we see the opportunity and the conversion um, rates are, are, are good and we're seeing great CPOs, then we're quite happy to push um, more spend and more budget towards that to, to make the most of that opportunity. So we're not too rigid in terms of, okay. of, what, we, um, of what we spend. Um, having said that, we kind of are always balancing that against our unpaid um, orders to make sure that we're not sort of top heavy in terms of uh, the paid activity versus unpaid and, and how that sort of blends out uh, for the whole business. Yeah. Luke, for you guys? I would say sort of uh, last, last year onwards, it's probably around, to give an actual percentage, it's probably like 40, 45 to 50% um, with sort of maybe 10% maybe going towards things like Twitter and then out of home and search and things taking up, uh, taking up the rest. But we've been kind of pushing that uh, down as much as possible during the Q4 period where we find it really expensive. And at that point, we'll push into, into other channels. And then this year, as we've seen performance improve again, we'll then shift it in the same, same sort of way as Kate. I think, uh, you know, Facebook, Facebook has, this, uh, has this thing where you see the cost of Facebook going up all the time, and especially a sharp peak, peak in Q4. And I think it's important that people don't look at it as a kind of like, this is my budget for the year, I'm going to spend it like this, and look at it more as a, if March is, you know, the best performance of the year, then I'll spend it here, and if November's awful, then I'll take it out. And I think that's just the way, the flexibility that you have to go with. Yeah, so both of you mentioned that same thing, I guess, right, that your focus is on, on CPA mm -hmm. as opposed to a budget set. Yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you plan that, like, from a practical perspective of, like, sales or production resources or, like, making sure that if you have, say, for example, in, in March, for argument's sake, that you can hugely scale up your Facebook activities? And I guess there's hopefully an automation to that. But how do you make sure you've got the production capacity or, the, like, the, the business ready to cope with those, with those spikes? I mean, we're quite lucky because we, we print everything on demand. So we don't have to have a stock holding to... Uh, be ready uh, in the event that we have a, a, a real big peak of sales. We obviously know that Q4 is really big for us, so we make uh, a lot of, there's a lot of planning that goes into making sure that all of our print houses are prepared and that all this kind of uh, paper stock is ready and the infrastructure is ready for that, for that peak season. Outside of that, we're able to cope quite comfortably with sort of fluctuations in sales outside of, of that real peak season. So um, we, we have an advantage, I think, in that, in that sense that we don't have to have that much um, infrastructure and planning in place and, and we can be quite nimble and quite agile in everything that we do. Yeah, and then Chris, obviously you're working with partners, right? So you're working with clients. How do you get involved in that planning process or the resourcing, not just the, the marketing aspect of it? Um, I think it varies. We've got some e-commerce companies that are sort of frictionless in the same way. So you can just spend when the going's good and, and rein it back when it's not. Uh, some buy, they tend to buy stock for a season. And actually, at the end of the season, they have sales to clear it out. All we're doing is, is if the campaign goes well, is we're bringing forward those sales. Uh, and they're selling them at full price instead of, you know, discounted at the end of the season. So um, yeah. that works pretty well. Uh, and I think that coming back to your budget point, one of our the people we work with, they moved a hundred thousand from spending on print like catalogs into Facebook uh, just for one month. You can probably guess which month of the year it was, um, and they completely smashed their kind of CPA target. So I think it's that it, it's that um, almost setting a challenge for Facebook as a channel and saying, let's see how far we can push it because actually there's a lot of scalability in there. Um, particularly at peak times of year. Yeah, and then just as a, a, a follow-up on that, so you talked about sales. Do you, do you change your approach during the sale process if pricing is dynamic or if like, content is selling out? How do you manage the feed or how do you manage the ads during that process? Um, it's, the feed actually becomes really important then because when something goes out of stock, it comes out of the feed, so it comes out of the ads and people get served with something else that's uh, relevant. So it's particularly at that time of year. But the other thing I would say is... Um, plan in, in, when you're approaching big events, whether it's sales or launches or anything else, um, just get the messaging planned in and launch the campaign in a, in a kind of timely way. I think people expect, because it's a sort of immediate channel, that consumers are suddenly going to react within a day or two, but actually it does take time for this stuff to land. 
Um, so I would say, yeah, it's, it's about good campaign planning, not just thinking on the hoof and changing something every, you know, every other day. Yeah, yeah. And then Luke, on a practical point, how hard is it to build a feed that can be used on Facebook for, for retargeting? Yeah, I think, I think feed-based targeting is seen as this really advanced, like, experts-only club. Uh, and it would be great if everyone could think that so that we can keep doing it. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's actually not that difficult, um, especially, you know, not to play that trumpet, but using smartly. Like, it's, it's, it's simply just, you know, breaking down your, your products into, into categories, labeling them appropriately, making sure that you have good imagery that represents the products. If you've got any kind of personalization to the products, it becomes slightly more complicated. Um, but you know, if it's if it's a standard e-commerce website, then it's then it's great because you're able to have all of your products, all of the prices, all of the categories laid out, and then you can you upload it into into Facebook or Smartly, or you can also do it for various other channels. Um, and then you know, it's it's just about tweaking what things you want it to uh, optimize your feed based on, whether it's based on category or based on like sales performance then it becomes a bit more complicated where you're feeding the data back. But it's all, you know, it's all laid out online on how to on how to do it. And I think that anybody, any business benefits by doing this sort of automated format of marketing because it just takes so much of those decisions away from you and gives them into the hands of the data instead. Because it's it's much better that it goes based on what's actually selling best than what you, you know, imagine will be best. Anything to add on the feed side? Yeah, I think if you're using Google Shopping, the same feed will work. Like it's a matter of a few clicks almost. Um, so uh, definitely, the uh, the configuration of the pixel to link to the feed requires a bit of dev work. But um, yeah, I think uh, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Cool. Agree. Cool. Let's um, let's go on to the next question then. Um, so, what's your take on Facebook viewability, and how do you take this into account in measuring and attributing success? Viewability is in seeing seeing the ads in the feed. I see. Um, yeah, I guess I guess there's a reference there to sort of the the 28 day typically post impression attribution versus sort of 24 hour post click. Yeah, I think uh, you know uh, a lot of a lot of people worry about that kind of thing. Uh, I think we we take all of that that issue out of the question by using purely a uh, a click basis for our measurement. Um, so we, we look at 28 days, uh, any sales that have come through after 28 days from the click actually happening. Um, but we will optimize towards a, like a seven day uh, or a 28 day with a, with a one day view so that Facebook's getting more data in order to target your ads more accurately uh, and in order to you know, have more data to work with. Uh, but at the same time, you're making sure that you're not accidentally taking sales away from other channels. Uh, because what we find when we look at the view conversions, a lot of those will be ones that will also be attributed to other channels. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, impressions, so uh, as I mentioned, we have this uh, attribution model which takes into account all of the interactions that a user has, um, but we do suppress impressions, so we don't give them as much credit as we would a click because we okay. don't feel like that that's a fair... Um, it wouldn't be fair to, to treat them equally. Um, so yeah, so we do sort of account for that in our in our attribution model, and we certainly uh, it sort of on the day in the platform, we're not really looking at, at view through conversions at all. We're as, as similar to Luke, we're only really looking at kind of one day post click. Um, in most cases, we find that most um, most of our customers will convert within around two to three days, maybe kind of eighty percent of those, and then there's a long tail sort of for the rest of the twenty eight. So uh, a one day post click gives us a fairly good read on on how that's actually going to perform um, in the next couple of days and, and out into the, the next 28. So um, yeah, that's how, we, that's how we treat it. Uh, I'd add to that, we use, for remarketing, we only do post click, uh, but for acquisition, um, where, where we've already excluded all of the, the known customers from the targeting group, actually we will do seven day post click and plus one post view. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of sense check that against what we're seeing in GA or what we're measuring through whatever client attribution there is. Um, but uh, I think it, because Facebook and Instagram particularly are such um, 
there's quite a lot of post view activity going on. Like a lot of people just don't click on stuff, particularly on Instagram. Um, it's good to keep it in your in your view, even if you're not, even if you're being conservative and sort of discounting it later. Yeah, and I think I think a part of that obviously is getting enough data to optimize towards right building that data yeah. that data funnel. So, and then the next question here um, from Nicholas is how does Facebook uh, perform versus search for new customer acquisition? So excluding retargeting. Uh, for us, it's pretty much uh, on a par. Um, certainly, uh, when we look on a on a last click basis, because obviously uh, search it f predominantly would be sort of last click. Um, we find that that they they perform pretty much as well. Certainly, uh, the non branded terms versus I mean, obviously branded, um, we couldn't compete with. But um, but yeah, certainly on on a non brand uh, basis, we we find that um, they're, they're pretty much on parity, which is impressive considering that most Google search there's there's so much intent behind it. Yeah, yeah. If you can match that with with targeted um, ads, then that's that's quite a, a good performance. I would say I would say for us. Uh, Search definitely performs better from a conversion rate and a click-through rate basis. Uh, like like Kate said, obviously it's an interest uh, and intent-driven channel. Uh, so you know, once once people have got to the stage where they're actually searching for our for our non-branded product terms, which are quite unusual, they're not they're not widely searched terms. You've then got people that are very interested in your product. So it definitely it definitely converts better. But I think that it's it's for us definitely not something that works on its own. Uh, Obviously, you don't get a lot of people that are just out there in the world and thinking, I need a Razor subscription service. Like, it's not a thing. So I think it's definitely something that's sort of an auxiliary channel for us. Uh, not many people come to it as their only touch point. Um, but it's definitely a very effective way of then converting those customers once they, once they know a little bit more about the product or they're educated by other brands that do big awareness campaigns. Cool. Yeah, I'd say, actually, um Search is so hotly contested. Like, there's a lot of big retailers, big brands with big spends um, that actually Facebook has proven to be quite a cost-effective acquisition channel. Uh, in many cases, it's undercutting search um, for a lot of our retailers um, up to a point. Uh, yeah. and, and it's about kind of balancing after that. Cool. Um, next question is about, um, uh, I guess, Instagram stories predominantly, but with more users navigating to stories as opposed to the news feed, how do you see the strategy adapting for a sales focus? Uh, I think we've, I mean, we've tested sort of story uh, placements in Instagram. We haven't actually found that they have worked really very well for us because I do think they are better for awareness and branding than they are for, um, certainly as far as we've been concerned, um, than for, for acquisition. Having said that, I think some of the newer formats, the ad units like uh, collections and canvas, slideshows, yeah. um, really lend themselves to telling a story about a product that you can't do with a, with a standard link ad. And so um, for us, that's less about telling a story about all of our products, but it means we can get really uh, in depth about uh, one product. So we can really uh, help to explain how that product works, what the personalization mechanic is, and sort of emulate picking up a book in a store and flicking through the pages. We can kind of show all of that um, within those types of ad formats. And so for us, that's, that's really useful and really, really um, Powerful. Yeah, I mean, it is a pretty forced experience, I think. And, and I think, you know, Facebook is, they've been very customer centric. And I think this is a little bit ad first, I think, rather than customer first. Do you think you need to adapt or change your, your, um, your strategy with regards to like content or thinking about the consumer context or their mindset? And actually, when you're interrupting somebody from, from going through those stories, like what are they thinking? How do you create cut through, I think? Um, any, any thoughts? I think, I mean, you have to be able to tell a story for sure. And the story has to come first. And the, you know, the commercial aspect is, is secondary. Otherwise, you don't get the engagement. So then it's neither good for conversion nor good for engagement. So yeah. forget about it. And actually, in some cases, we've built ads um, that with a really good story that go, that's quite shareable and you know, creates a lot of comments. And then we remarket to those universes of people who've engaged with a more salesy ad separately. And that's actually worked reasonably well. But in many cases, just going straight for the sale actually overall is still more cost effective. Okay, okay, even even in that environment? Even in that environment. Okay, anything from your side? Yeah, I think I think like Chris has said, I think as as people get more and more frustrated with like how many ads they're seeing and how, how clustered up it 
uh, it's it's becoming it becomes more and more about how you can do that sort of uh, long term more sequence concept of you know educating someone about the product in a in a more natural way and then converting them after the fact. I think uh, you know more and more we're we're turning to you know uh, not necessarily influencers but uh, you know third party groups that can make video content for us that's very shareable or we'll make some of it in house and then we'll look at how we can you know link that to perhaps a, a blog piece and how we can then convert people either within the blog piece or remarket to those people uh, and i think it's it's about making sure that there's like a consistent message that just pushes someone more and more steps down that funnel um, and it becomes less about your your website multiple steps and more about the steps that they take before they get to the site. It almost becomes like they get to the website and they're there just to buy the product. Of course, we, we are running a bit out of time, but um, the next question from Isabella, do you use any external ad management tools to create and or optimize your Facebook account? <laughs> so, um, Isabella's not a smartly employee, by the way, so, um, um, but there we go. Um, do you have any insight to share on the new feature from Instagram, shoppable post? I can quickly say for us, uh, we haven't. We have a bit of a limitation because it's a personalised uh, product. Um, the the process of creating the book requires you to do it on our site, just so that we can take that data. Um, okay. But I can imagine for kind of fashion brands um, and uh, that kind of thing, I think it could be really really interesting. But yeah, unfortunately for us, we haven't been able to test it. Okay. I think I think it allows you to make some really nice kind of turning lifestyle into a, into a shoppable format is quite is quite a nice thing. I think I've seen quite a lot of other people use it. I think for, for us, it's, it's a little bit less natural to have like a, like a shoppable post of someone shaving or something like that. But I think I've seen a lot of um, clothes brands and sports brands especially use it quite effectively just because, you know, you, you see it in the context that you're actually going to use it and, uh, you know, you get a much, much better experience and then it's just a quick, such a quick process that I think it's going to become more and more prevalent. Okay. So I'm going to use the last question just to try and just to try and wrap up, but um, and I'm going to elaborate on it. So where would you recommend me to start to learn the basics on how to use Facebook? So where can you learn and, and how can you kind of get more information? And also like any top tip. So we'll start from Chris. So where can you learn and what would be your one recommendation of something that you must do? Um, I, Facebook Blueprint is pretty good, I think. I don't know if people heard of Blueprint. I think show of hands. Has anyone done it? Has anyone passed it? Oh, well done. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's a good starting place. It's free. Um, it's all online. Uh, I think in terms of the basics, definitely get the site pixel correctly configured. And if you sell a lot of products, more than you know, even 20 or 30, I guess, definitely get your product feed sorted out. I think those two things open up a lot more opportunity in terms of efficient, creative, targeting, automation. Um, and I would say make sure you've got a brilliant, uh, a, a good quality customer feed so that you can target lookalikes of your existing customers or you can target the customers themselves. So those three things, get those sorted out straight away because without them, you're kind of scrabbling around, um, which is good for Facebook, but not good for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd agree in terms of uh, Facebook Blueprint, I think is a really uh, a really useful tool. I also, uh, there's a blog called John, uh, by John Loomer, who oh, I yeah. find uh, really useful, yeah. and he uh, there's lots of updates on new features, so it's a really great place to keep up to date with uh, new uh, new features that are launched. Um, and in terms of like a, um, a tip, I'd say maybe, I mean, if you're just starting out, maybe just focus on your retargeting. I mean, Facebook is a great platform for retargeting. So um, if you want to just kind of dip your toe in the water, that could be just a really great place to start. Cool. You've got yeah. the final words, Luke. So. <laughs> uh, Jesus. Um, I, think, I think, yeah, um, what the other guys have said, I think I would then look at, um, you know, interests that are related to your group uh, as being a good place to start before you have enough people to build a really effective lookalike. I think once you can, lookalikes are the most effective way cost-effective way to find your people and it's just about cinching down like a, a more and more accurate lookalike group until you get the perfect audience uh, and then you can use things like uh, Facebook Creative Hub to you know mock up some ads uh, and then just constantly iterate. Cool well thank you for joining us um, please join me in thanking the panel and hopefully there's been some takeaways there that we can all take back to our day jobs. So. <laughs>